welcome to another episode of the Haskin Cast podcast. I am your host, Scott Haskin, and I have a very special guest with me, a very good friend of mine I've known for going on 10 years now, we figure. Uh, he has recently completed his score for a film called The Reef Stocked, and that is available now. I've got the links in the show notes. Check it out. The score is fantastic. The movie has got to match it. If the score overpowers the movie, I'll be so sad, <laughs> but I doubt it does. Here he is, Mark Smythe. Mark, how are you? Hi, Scott. What's what's your tagline for your show again? The Haskin Fantastin, what is it? <laughs> the Haskin Cast Podcast. Haskin Cast Podcast. Yeah, it's got a, it's got a nice oh, yeah. little flow to it. I, I can't do an American accent, even though I've been here for nine years. That's I, right, I can't either. <laughs> I'm excited. Well, you know, I, I, I have to say just about everyone I've ever met from Australia has just been like a really cool person that I'm happy to know. I don't know if you guys just have some sort of thing that you breed on, on the continent or what. But it's it's been an amazing journey of people I've met from there. Well, here's the thing with that. I'm a little bit of an imposter there. I'm not actually Australian. You're not. Nope. You see see the bird to, to my side there? Yes. So this is a Kiwi. Oh. I am a New Zealander. Well, I will then say everyone I've met from New Zealand <laughs> <It's too laughs> has been absolutely fantastic. That's, I think yeah, you're the only one, but <laughs> it over. Are we is that is that it? Yeah, it was, it was great. Podcast? It was no, great talking I mean, to you. I'm I'm being mean. I apologize. No, no. I I sound like an Australian. I like to think I sound like a posh Australian. I actually lived in Melbourne for thirteen years before I moved okay. to LA. So ah. I'm I'm kind of a hybrid. Yeah, you know, it, it's it's really weird too the way that we cross cultures and then we start uh, adapting to different places that we are and the different people that we associate with and and you know it, it's interesting that you haven't developed a bit of an American accent though. Yeah, it, it is because I I definitely developed an Australian accent. Um, hasn't happened here, uh, so but you know I'm I'm fine with that and you know in all fairness to Australians. What I'm doing now, I, I definitely owe to my, you know, good long decade in Australia. I definitely learned some, definitely developed as a person and as a musician in my time there. So any any construed coolness, I, I've, I've got to acknowledge the Australian component of that. I really appreciate that. Yeah. I was thinking about it earlier, and you and I kind of touched on this before we started recording. I'm pretty sure that we met at the NAMM show in 2014. Yep. And then at the, at the Scorecast dinner that night, because I was editing yeah. Scorecast back then. Uh, so oh, we've, wow. we've known each other quite a while, and I've really enjoyed your journey. You're always posting clips of little melodies and things that you've come up with. Very talented on piano. Uh, I wish I had half of your skills. I sit down at a piano, and I'm like... I can I can play what I want or I can make it work, but I'm not a piano player. I listen to you and you're like, yeah, I just came up with this little thing. And like, <laughs> I, I, it, it would be 10 years before I could play that. <laughs> well, thank you. Funnily enough, I've, I've heard enough people um, make positive comments about my little uh, piano ditties that um, I'm, I'm aiming to properly record the, the best of those and turn them into an album before year's end. Oh, very nice. Um, and I'm sure I'm sure you're selling yourself short and that you can make some keyboard moves yourself. I, I know you've got some skills too. Well, thank you. I, I have some keyboard skills, but I would not say I'm a good pianist. I, there's, a special, <laughs> there's a special thing about the way that you play piano that is so different from the way a keyboard is played. Uh, I've, I've written some piano pieces that I'm really happy with, but I, I would not say, I, I, okay, I'll, I'll give you a, a line of reference. I loved be uh, Beethoven's fifth piano concerto and I was bound and determined to learn how to play uh, every single note. The, um, the emperor. Yes. And I sat there and sat there. There's my bad version. <laughs> <laughs> well, here, here's my moment of pride. So I, I sat there and I listened to it and I listened to it and I tried to play it. I'm like, this is physically impossible or I'm just horrible at this. So oh, I, I ordered the book. Oh. And so I got the sheet music. It's, um, it's for two piano players. What? <laughs> like, oh. No wonder I can't do it. 
damn. So we won't try and do it right now then. It's such a beautiful piece though, isn't it? That's all I know. It's but that that is fantastic because you get the points where it needs to be gentle, the points where it needs to be a little more harsh, and that is the key to that piece of music. The emotional roller coaster that you go through listening to that song is absolutely phenomenal. It's like a film score. It really is. It really is. And speaking of film scores, I got to tell you, Mark, I when you sent this over to me, uh, I I couldn't wait to listen to it and. I thought the reef stocked. Okay, it's got to be like a, a shark type movie or a squid or something like that. And, <laughs> and so I just I tried to keep I, I tried to keep open minded about what the film was because I was listening to the score without the video, mm. and I felt in the score I could really follow the journey of the movie, the peaks and valleys where it gets intense, where it backs off and breathes a little bit. But it's a really deceptive score because. The first half of it, you get this sense of peace, but you also feel like I shouldn't close my eyes. Something is not right here, although I feel like I'm in a very tranquil world. Good. That was absolutely the intention. The The film is a slow burn. There's a very, very long exposition of other underlying stories that the main characters go through before there's even a hint of trouble on the water. So I'm glad that you got that sense from the score alone. That means I did a good good job for the director. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm very curious. Uh, now, for those who uh, are listening that are not film composers or not, not familiar with the, the process of being a film composer, after you get hired, or hopefully you get hired and then, and then you move <laughs> on to the next round, Um, Because we find there's so many projects that we get invited to, but eight other people were invited to, and maybe somebody else's idea was just a little more on the mark than yours. It's a very depressing Mm. profession at times. Yeah, it's it's tough out there. Um, In fact, you know, for, for, for all the sort of, you know, look at me and my shark film that I've got right now, um... I, I had two films lined up for the second half of this year that have both been delayed. So I'm sort of like, huh, okay. Mm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, and, and to make matters worse, you know, filming had stopped during COVID. So there was a long time where just nothing was being made. And all yeah. people were doing was editing whatever footage they had left over and yeah. trying to put projects together. But it wasn't anything mm-hmm. serious, you know. Yeah. Uh, it is, it is a very interesting process because when you watch the film for the first time, and typically that would be with the director in the spotting session where he's pointing out, okay, I want music to start here. I want it to stop here. I want this. I want that. How do you like to talk to a director to feel your way around the score or the potential score that you're about to develop? How, how do I like to or what actually happens? How do you <laughs> like to? Because what usually happens is going to not be in your control. Um, I mean, well, in an ideal world, I would be brought on early as in, as in script stage. Mm -hmm. And my first ever thriller film, um, with Chris Sun, who I've done four films with now, uh, I came up with just some piano themes for that purely from reading the script. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think I did five or six and one of them he really liked and that became the main theme of the entire score for that film and i haven't got to do that very often um it's pretty rare in in this instance the film was already completely temped and um the director andrew chalky you know he he i wouldn't say he had temp love but he he definitely wanted, um, you know, he de- definitely wanted a similar feel to what was there. Mm. And you know, when you've got cues from Hans Zimmer in there, you sort of think, mm, right. So I've got to sound like Hans Zimmer at the end, but but on a uh, Mark Smythe budget. Now that's <laughs> right. fine. Now, having, having said that, I I did didn't really need a. Um, 
a spotting session for this per se because the temp was already in there and so and because Andrew was was back in Australia and I was here in LA we did everything over Zoom mm -hmm. and what we would do is we would do it by reel and we would watch through each reel we'd discuss what was there in the temp what he liked about the temp and what he didn't mm -hmm. so you know I didn't have to completely um, follow the vibe and in fact there were certain instances where we both didn't didn't like what was there so that's that's how we did it and there were seven reels and we did it by reel and we just you know progressed through had a lot of zoom meetings and i had the luxury of being able to record those and so if i'd forgotten one of his notes i could go back to what he said so you know it, it took a bit of getting used to for him but once once he once he was there with that and you know he was able to look at my bits of film in progress with my music and, and it worked we got through very nice i yeah. think uh, well i'm just going to go on record as saying i hate the concept of a temp score <laughs> it, it just putting it in there associating a piece of music with a piece of film it becomes an uphill battle to try and come up with something better because even if they mm. don't like it that's still stuck in their head as what yeah. goes with the scene yeah and i understand the necess necessity of it um in terms of you know um, the the filmmakers have to show distributors or investors or whoever you know stuff in progress, and if there's no music in there, then you know it's it's not going to help their cause. So I, I understand why they have it in there. Um, yeah, there's the, the, you know the, there are only so many times when when you want to hear you know refer to the temp and you sort of think. <laughs> But it, it wasn't it wasn't too bad with this at all thankfully once once i'd established my own sonic template be it for tension brutal attacks or otherwise it, it was he, he would start asking for my themes rather than the temp that's theme. good yeah so that that's good. that's where you want to get as quickly as possible obviously yeah uh, and, and the worst thing is that they will pick uh, pieces by like Hans Zimmer or Steve Jablonski or Danny Elfman. It's like, <laughs> do you really need to pit me against guys that get multi-million dollars to do a score and can do it to the uh, most extreme way possible? And I'm sitting here with a much smaller budget with I can hire three or four people maybe. And, you know, that that it's it's it, it they're just pitting you against something that's almost impossible to to match. Yeah, it's it's a little bit like, hey, I was driving down the road with a Lamborghini the other day. Can you can you take me for a ride in in your Ford Fiesta? <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly how it feels. Yeah. Uh, so, but but in general, I what I like to do, and I worked with a lot more indie uh, directors, so I, I had a little more, um, I guess, leeway with them than you would probably in most of the films that you're working on. I tried to find a way to talk about. Uh, instead of instrumentation or anything like that, really just talk about the emotion. What do you want the audience to feel? How intently do you want them to feel yeah. it at this yeah. point? And then just really create the score around emotions because it seemed like a lot of the the younger directors that I worked with would want to go into, I really want rock and roll music or I really want something hardcore or I really want this or that. And it doesn't necessarily work or enhance the film but they would get that stuck in their head. So I tried to get away from that and get more into the emotion of things. When you're doing your spotting sessions, is it, when, when, you're, when you're discussing that part of it, do they get into that a lot? Or do they really just say, just kind of follow the guideline of the temp. I want it to start around this point, end around this point, and be about this intense? Yeah, um, we, we talked more about mood and in in and out points uh, rather than instrumentation. Um, and in fact, it's funny with directors because often they'll, whenever they, I mean, this doesn't go with everyone, but whenever they mention an instrument, um, you know, they'll go blah 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 harp, and I'm sitting there going, what what is he talking about? <laughs> and it turns out he's talking about my ukulele. Oh, and so that gets a little bit awkward. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. It's yeah. It's 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 good if you can focus on mood, and psychology, and emotions. Especially with a score like this, because it's very ambient through the majority yeah, I, of the film. It is, and I like that you said that um, it it feels tranquil, but with an underlying um, 
sort of sense of unease because that is what we were going for. There's a lot of open water shots in this film and it's one of those things where if you didn't know that something was lurking out there, you would just think, oh, this is lovely. It, it, could, it could be a nature documentary about the vast Pacific Ocean, but instead there's, you know, there is danger beneath. And um, Andrew's key word throughout the whole thing was tension. It almost became an in-joke. He would say, did I mention tension enough? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have to, to give you really serious props because you nailed it. It is really a Good. challenge to take something that's ambient and comfortable and yet make it uncomfortable at exactly the same time. Typically, most people, I think, would tend to go with peaks and valleys, right? You have a, a peak of relaxing, you have a peak of tension, and just yeah. kind of go back and forth with that. But you found a way to put both elements in at the same time. And I, I, I can't say, I, I can't find words to really say how much you nailed that. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Because, um, yeah, that, that is pretty much what I was trying to do. Because it wasn't noticeable. I mean, like, okay, if you, if you had like a nice piece of ambient music and then you put like a water harp over it or something that yeah. is designed to, to really be in your face tension, that would be obvious. But this was so subtle. I mean, the line yeah. had, it, the balance of that had to be a big challenge. Yeah, it, it, the, Certain, certain cues in particular really evolve into something verging on nasty. And if, yeah, and, and it sort of sneaks up on you, kind of like the shark. And I like that you guys didn't have that musical shark cue, you know, that the danger is coming and it gets louder and bigger. I, I like that you didn't do that. Yeah, we, we talked about that a lot. And one of the first things we said was, well, um, hello, Jaws. We can't do anything remotely like that. Um, I'm a huge John Williams fan. I'm a huge Jaws fan. And I had to force myself to not even think about it, not watch it. Um, I even have the soundtrack on vinyl here, if you wow, don't mind. Wow, nice. Check it out. Absolutely. That is, uh, that is one of my all-time favorite movies. I don't know how many times I've watched it. Yeah. And to think that, that Spielberg laughed when John Williams first played him the theme, that's, that's the best part to me. He did, yeah. Uh, so we, we, we decided no theme for when the shark is doing the actual stalking, um, just sort of hints, a lot of, a lot of um, sort of stings and beats. Um, well, I don't want to give anything away because hopefully people will be inspired to watch the film. Right, absolutely, yeah. So really the only shark theme is when he's already attacking. Mm. Well, and, and I think it's not just a Jaws thing. I think that's a general horror movie trope these days that any, you have to build the tension with the score and you have to give them the feeling that something's about to strike instead of having it just come out of nowhere. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are, there are some, some fake builds in, in this. And I've got to say, uh, you know, I've done quite a few horror thriller films now and um, as with Chris Sun, Andrew Trout, he's a real master of tension. Um, so, you know, all jokes aside, he, he really, he got the best tension out of me he possibly could have got. I was his farming fence. I was taught. <laughs> <laughs> like a bowstring. Yes. Uh, Ready to strike. Now, now, how did it, did the music affect you at all? Writing tense music, did it kind of make you feel tense and edgy as well? Um, no. Oh, okay. No, I mean, um, because you see, the the, the four girls um, in this film, I was sort of just following following their journey emotionally and psychologically. Um, so, if anything, actually, sort of yes and no. I was affected by the the more um, poignant moments that they had um, because. In the score, it's like the, there are very, very heartfelt, sonorous cues. And, um, you know, at the very end, it's, 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 quite, it's quite, quite emotional. And Andrew was saying, you know, I want people to cry at the end. So I was a little bit affected by that, even though, you know, I was looking at the same scene many times. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's amazing the the power of it. And of course, as we add the music to it and make the scene more emotional, uh, I tend to find that it does start to affect me more after the music is in it than when I'm working on it. Like when I yeah. when I listen back to something and go, okay, does that really fit? Am I happy with this? And I'll start getting caught up in the film because now I'm actually seeing it as a viewer for the first time, having that full experience with the score. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm a sucker for minor keys and minor melodies. Um, and I, 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 find, I find them soothing. Um, and it's so I, I, I poss- possibly trying to say here, I, I enjoy listening to music that other people might find sad. Um, and it's funny really because, you know, out, out and about in the world I like to joke around and everything and then people hear my music and it's, it's so much more serious and they're like, wow, you wrote that? Like, yeah. It's, it's really amazing how people tend to associate what an artist does with who they are as a person. You know, we we as artists, our job is to create, and especially as film composers, we're tasked with creating whatever it is the film needs, whether it needs a piece of Western music or, you know, a, something from Africa, some rhythmic thing or some really bizarre melodic stringed instrument from China or, you know, all these different things. But we go into a zone. We just become that thing that we need to do and, and focus on doing it. Who we are outside of that. I would, I, if I had met you and not known already that you were a composer, I might think you were a comedian. Because <laughs> you have a great sense of humor. You know, <laughs> I, I really, I remember uh, when I first moved to LA and I saw you at Catherine's birthday party. I think that was the first time I saw you after I moved out there. Uh, mm-hmm. You were hilarious. I'm like, why aren't you a comedian? Well, because you're a composer. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. That's, goodness me. That's, that's, that's interesting. Um, that's, you're not the first person that said that. Really? Okay. Um, and funnily enough, speaking of Catherine, it was her birthday yesterday. It was, yeah. So, um, I may or may not have sent her a special heavy metal guitar greeting. Nice. Um, I'm, well, I'm glad you think that I've got some humor in me. Um, Absolutely. If I, don't, if I don't sort of progress and make it to the next level as a composer, maybe I'll... Maybe I'll pop into the Upright Citizens Brigade or something. <laughs> you could just work up a set, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, but I think I think you have to have some element of a sense of humor in this business. Otherwise, it, it just gets far too depressing. Uh, and yeah. it, it's a this is one of the tougher jobs or, or careers, I think, that you can have. Oh, my God, yes. Um, and like, like I was saying before, you know, anyone looking on Instagram or Bookface at the moment would go, oh, look at Mark, he's on fire. And, you know, I'm, I'm so happy that the film's out there. And I actually saw it um, on Friday night at Lamb Lake Glendale. It's, it's running for a week there. And went, went with a few friends. And, you know, I, I expected it to be good, but it was actually really good. Scott, I was, I'd sort of, for many moments, I forgot that I'd actually done the music and was actually just engrossed in the story, even though I'd seen it so many times. And my friends loved it, and some of them actually got scared. Um, But it is a tough career. And like I said, I've got things on the horizon, but they're longer on the horizon than I would like. So, you know, um, and I, you know, I look at friends back home in New Zealand and friends in Australia, and they're all, you know, they've settled down and they have children and they have a wonderful, wonderful life. you know, I have a wonderful life too, but I'm definitely leading, leading a different one from a lot of my um, contemporaries from my younger days. You, you really need to be in for the long haul uh, with with the composing bag. Yeah, it's it, you know, you were saying that this movie is a slow burn. I think the life of a composer is a slow burn. Absolutely, and sometimes you feel like your your flame is is vibrant, and other times it's it sort of feels like a a a mere flicker let me ask you so i remember what it was like the first time i heard my music in a film in a theater it was one of the most magical things i've ever experienced isn't it were you happy with the mix did the sound of it you know kind of make you feel like okay this is this worked out well yeah i was really happy with it actually uh so much so that i emailed um paul parola 
who was um, from Boom Tracks in Melbourne, um, because I, I wasn't there for the final mix, and so we we actually had we actually had a conversation at one point where I said to him, I, I trust I trust you to do to do right by me, the composer here, since I can't be there, and the overall sound mix is fantastic, um, possibly helped by the really good sound set up in the cinema that I saw it in. But, you know, I I worked really hard on my own mixing of the score. Again, because of time and budget constraints, I, I sort of had no choice but to do it myself. But I've done that often, and nobody's come back to me yet and said, oh, what's going on with your mix? So um, it's really well done. The cinematography and the sound, it's, it's very, very well meshed. I was okay. very, very happy. Well, I can say that yeah. the mix on the album is fantastic. And it's it when you hit the tension parts, it's not that it's so over loud that I have to turn the volume down or anything like that. I mean, it's it's felt you get that push from it, but not to the point where it's annoying or harmful to my ears, you know, and then the tranquil parts are it just it's it's just like sitting on a cloud that's sitting on a pool of dark water. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> you know? I'm taking that quote, if I may. Do it. Sitting on a cloud that's floating over dark waters. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. But the mix is fantastic. I, I've listened to it on a couple different pairs of headphones, and I listened to it on my studio speakers. And uh, yeah, I, 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 there's nothing I could come back at you and say, you know, Mark, this is a really good mix, but <laughs> I wouldn't, good. I wouldn't change I mean, anything. Uh, good. I mean, I, I, I really was as careful as possible as I could be, again, within within the time frame I had. And obviously, I did the same thing, listened on headphones, listened on studio monitors, and, you know. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting, too, because I'd sort of think, oh, yep, I've got it. And then there'd be one little sequence of tribal drums, and I'd be like, what on earth were you doing there? That is the sloppiest plane. How can you? And, and you know, it... it You'd think you could fix such a thing really quickly, and oh, half an hour later, I'm like, Ugh. and you found four <laughs> other things that you've decided you're unhappy with in the process. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so let me ask you this because I, I, as a composer, this is something that I struggle with from time to time. You've written a lot of pieces of music over the years. Mm -hmm. Where do you decide that this piece of music is done? Oh, that's a really good question. And in fact, it's a question I've heard before in the context of um, the SCL, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you, you know, I worked for them for years. Oh, yeah. And, and I, I had a, a, a big role in, in helping produce their first awards night. And there were a whole lot of videos were made at the end of Zoom Q&As that I used to host. And that was the question, how do you know when a piece of music is finished? Um, and... God damn it. I wish I had a witty answer for you. Um, <laughs> it, it, it is a tough question, to, to be fair. <laughs> I struggle with it, too, because even when I think it's done, I'm like, well, let me let me just try this. And I find that if if the next thing I try just is too much, then the song I mean, is done. If it's, if it's for a film, then then for any for any cue I'm working on, outside of the director being happy, um, I'll then... And I'll, you know, I'll say to them, look, I'm great. Let me just make sure that I'm, I'm happy with the mix and how it sits in the scene. So mm -hmm. for me, I think a piece of film music is finished when you watch the scene back for the 20th time and nothing feels like it's not fitting. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. No, I, I really like that. I think that's, that's, that's it because if you're, if you're not feeling the scene – which it can be hard to do because you've heard it and seen it so many times. But if yeah. that piece of music with that video can engross you in the scene, it's done. Yeah. And with this film, I was fortunate in that the performances of uh, all four uh, actors were very, very good. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that often they were saying a lot just with their facial expressions. And so I really honed in on that. Um, and so that that's just it. If if my score was not if, if my score was actually just there and I was focused on them, then I, I was like, Yep, that's that's working. Like if there's ever a moment where 
where the music in a film's taking you out of the scene, then something's wrong. Yeah. You know, kind of, kind of like, kind of like that scene in Game of Thrones. You know, with what's his name? You know, the English guy. Right. Um, I can't you know, he wants name. to be a New Zealander. Ed, what's his name? Ah, uh, it's not coming to me. I'm never good on the fly like that. I, I'm such a great podcaster. I can never remember anything when I need to. You know, the, the redhead guy, the the roly poly guy. I can't remember his name. I'm quite happy to. I'm quite happy that I can't. <laughs> But, but you know the scene I mean, right? He's yeah. in Game of Thrones. He's like, he's and he's like a Lannister soldier, and he's he's playing his song, and he's like, oh, it's a new song. It's like, oh my god! And I I used to actually use that scene. I I used to teach film music at UCLA Extension. Can you believe? And I would say to my students, no, that's the Ed what's his name moment. You've taken me out of the scene. Yeah, I uh, I like to to use the analogy of when I'm in a, a, a theater. Um, if I can see the edge of the screen, yeah, it's gone too far because I should be so engrossed in the film that I don't realize I'm physically sitting in a movie theater. Yeah, I'm just in like the movie is the world and there's nothing yeah. outside of that. Now, granted, there are designed lulls in a film to give you a little bit of a breather before the final scene or whatever's going to happen. And yeah. those are okay. But if if I'm not supposed to be out of the film, that's a sign that something has gone wrong somewhere. Yeah, no, you're right. And Ed Sheeran is is the oh thing, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, who we've happily forgotten. Mm -hmm. You know, but, he wants to be a New Zealander, apparently. Really? Yeah, I did not know that. Not sure about that, to be honest. <laughs> but you know what? What you're talking about is very true. Also, the mix can do that. The mix can can be so bad that yeah. it, it takes you out of the film because the balance is not there. I can't stand watching movies where they, they've done what they think is a good home video mix, and then I'm constantly turning up and down the volume dial because the, the balance is just not there. That's right. And what, what can be very dangerous, of course, for the composer, if you're not in the final dub um, and you've sent stems off to everybody, you know, there there is the real risk that people might decide to mess around um, with the score to the detriment of everything, not just the score itself. Happily, that hasn't really happened to me, and with this film in particular, I was just I was pleasantly surprised. There was so little, so little was changed from what I had delivered. Um, so, yes, well done, them. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, me. Uh, I will. I will be a better judge of that when I see the the film in in yeah. its entirety. I mean, look, but yeah, even just hearing the moments. score, you know. Yeah, there are a couple of moments just at the very beginning and and at the very end in the credits. I'd sent them um, a four minutes credits medley, and uh, they clearly ran out of time, so they sort of looped it back. And the, oh. the um, transition was like, oh, do you? Mm -hmm. Not in the same key. I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> I hope nobody notices. But I think most people know that you know not that they. That's usually what happens with the credits. The filmmakers or the editor will just use yeah. what's there. So I, I think in general, though, people tend to think of a composer as somebody who puts notes and instruments and rhythms together. But there's there's a whole another, even maybe more important layer, which is volumes. And there's yeah. reasons that a, an instrument might be quieter in the mix and it's meant to be felt until it's meant to be heard. And mm -hmm. if they change the volume in a way that doesn't match the film, that throws the entire balance of that piece off because yeah. now the piece, the instrument you're not supposed to hear, you're hearing. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, and, you know, I will, I will say that I, I did some some tweaking for the soundtrack release that's different from what happens in the film. Mostly so that as a standalone piece of music, it makes sense, whereas in the film certain instruments would have been slightly louder um, just because that's, that's what Andrew wanted in that scene, whereas listening to it on its own, it's like, mmm, do, do the crazy pender style strings really need to be that loud for that long, um, and I, I imagined what that would be like for the listener. So, 
Um, well, and it is a different experience because you're not focused. The, the music is secondary to the visual, right? Yeah. So when you're watching the movie and you're hearing the score, you're, yeah. you're feeling and hearing the score, but you're watching the visual. When you're just yeah. listening to the soundtrack, that is 100% the focal point. So some, that's why I think people don't necessarily like uh, to listen to film music is because it's out of context. And a lot of pieces don't necessarily make sense as musical pieces without that visual. You are exactly right, Scott. And in fact, the, the soundtrack, there's not nearly as much music on the soundtrack as there is in the film because it's exactly what you're talking about. There's, there's a lot of cues that really, really work in the context of being matched to the film, but listening back to them on their own, I, I, sort, of, I sort of auditioned them myself and I just thought, no, that's, that's just, that drones on for too long. Um, I wouldn't want to listen to that. Um, so I just made sure there was enough representation of each style in there. Um, had I put all of the music in there, I think the soundtrack would have been an hour long. And I just, I'm just not sure people have the capacity to put that much listening investment into a soundtrack. I could be wrong. Um, I think there's. I, I think John Williams could get away with that, but ah, he's usually yes, writing... Yes. And, and no offense to, to anybody who's not John Williams, but I mean, <laughs> when, you, when you listen to the intricacies of his yeah. writing, there's always three levels of things going on at almost any given time. Yeah. Um, his pieces for film really are standalone pieces as oh, well. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas most of the stuff we write, we write more as underscore, which yeah. is again meant to be felt more than, than anything else. Yeah. Uh, he, he's a rare example. You know, I would say Steve Jablonski is another one. Uh, Hans Zimmer yeah. obviously would be another one. Um, Danny Elfman just kind of goes in whatever direction, <laughs> you know, he <laughs> goes in. Uh, yeah. But but all of those guys follow that same, you know, their their pieces are just all epic pieces. Yeah, and they're they're distinctly them. Yeah. You, you always know when you're listening to John Williams. And exactly. But intricacy I, is... is the key word there. Mm -hmm. But I find I find this score so enjoyable. And I am somebody who who can listen to film music and and really enjoy it, partially because it's what I've spent a lot of my time doing, but but also just because I just find that dramatic side of music is something that we just don't write for unless we're writing for something dramatic. Yeah. Like we don't write dramatic pieces like that on our own. Um no. No, we don't. Not usually. Well, or, mm, I've written some, not dramatic, but some quite dark uh, choir music Ooh, over the years. Nice. Yeah. I'll have to yeah. check that out. I'm a big fan of that. I, I think that, you know, when, when I think choir, mostly I think like, you know, big church, people in robes singing, you know, arias and, and bits to God or whatever. But man, you can do so much with a choir. You can. And in fact, I've used... Um, I've used some of my choir music because I could um, in several horror films uh, that Chris Sun directed. Um, in fact, um, the last film I did with him, The Possessed, that's finally getting a US release in October, so I'll finally be releasing the soundtrack. And yes, choir and um, dark soprano features in some quite prominent Cues. Well, keep yeah. me posted. I'm already, I'm already salivating to hear that. Yeah. Funnily <laughs> enough, I, I, that's kind of, that's kind of my thing. Um, my thing. I <laughs> believe it or not, I was a chorister in the Nelson Cathedral Choir for five years. Really? <clears throat> yep. I was, I was even the head chorister, and I sang all the solos. And so for five years, without realizing it, I was getting this sort of ad hoc training in harmonic structure and then years later um my my oldest sister back in new zealand she directs a professional choir and i started writing pieces for them and then they were getting funding for me to you know be commissioned to write more and so i've got a collection of about 10 pieces now and um it just feels natural to me to write for choir and for voice so I really like doing that. And I tried to, <clears throat> there's a little bit of soprano in, in this score, just in the first two cues, and then that's it. And I always try to sneak in some soprano or choir to any score I do. I didn't, didn't quite get away with it 
to the extent I usually do with this film, and that's fine. It's, it's, it's it possibly would have been too much if right. it had been in there in certain scenes. Well, with this, <laughs> this kind of music, there's only certain kinds of layering that you can do without something yeah. being really noticeable. Yeah, and in fact, you mentioned Tranquil earlier, and so that's why a Soprano did fit with the earlier scenes. Uh, you know, as the as the story progresses. All tranquility is gone. Oh, sure. Well, yeah, you got to get rid of that in a horror movie. Uh, mm-hmm. Are you thinking about doing an album of, of your choir works? Uh, I actually already did. I released an EP of it uh, last year. Oh, I did not oh, catch that. You. Yeah, please do. It's called Cantilene, which is some fancy Latin word to do with voices. I forget the exact meaning, but um, it's a nice looking cover. I'll send it to you. Oh, yeah, please. I, I would love to yeah. hear that. I don't know how I missed that. Oh, well, because I released it in July last year and was sort of all over the social medias with it and sort of been focusing on shark matters of right, late. Right, But I'll absolutely send it to you. Oh, yeah. I would love that, yeah. Uh, yeah. I look forward to your new album that's going to come out before the end of the year and another soundtrack coming out in October. That's fantastic. Yeah, very, very different um, musical forms, but both both forms of music I'm I'm really enjoy. Well, let me ask you one more question. I, I found that even in, within one film, I might have eight or nine different, completely different styles of music. You know, you have to write music for what they're listening to in the car and then what happens when they go to the club and when they're, you know, on the beach yeah. and the romantic scenes. I mean, as, as film composers, we, even within one film, can be pulled in so many different directions. Mm-hmm. Do you find that challenging to avoid themes during those parts, even though they might relate to characters, but it doesn't make sense to have themes in those pieces? Um, it depends what's required and what style is required. Um, as in, for, for the Reef Stalked, um, I was able to draw on my guitar skills or um, for a couple of the quieter, more sort of, you know, everything's okay uh, cues in that. You know, I was using acoustic guitar. I was using electric guitar with an ebo on it. Um, probably sounds like slide guitar to the uninitiated. So I enjoyed doing that, and I enjoyed being able to do... And again, I was sort of led by the temp that was in there, and I, I ended up liking what I did more than the temp, I'm happy to say. And Andrew was happy too. So it, it depends what's asked. So if I'm asked to do some guitar stuff, I'm all for it. Um, I was actually asked to tackle um, a sort of industrial techno style for the nightclub scene in The Possessed. And I'm just going to freely admit, I now know that that's really not my style. (laughs) And it's not the style I want to try again. And they they ended up getting production music, and that's fine. Um, And we, you know... Me and Chris quickly realized that it wasn't wasn't quite going to work out. So, you know, it it depends on the style. So any, anything guitars, anything piano, you know, I, I might struggle with jazz, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. That's a tough, and especially if they just say jazz, because it's such a broad term. Yeah, because um, I, you know, I, I was lucky enough to have a piano teacher mother, so that's, that's why I feel quite natural at the piano. Um, so... You know, I'm, I feel like I can get get a, get away with most styles, but there, there's definitely a couple that I don't want to go near, and I'll seek help from elsewhere or send them in the direction of production music if it's not going to work for me. Sure, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, we can't yeah. we can't be experts at everything. That would just be ridiculous. No, and I, I don't want to be. I, I I'm I'm old and ugly enough to know what I'm good at now, and um, I'm so happy that I'm playing the piano a lot because I sort of wasn't for a while and I just started nooding away mm-hmm. and honestly the only reason I was posting them on Instagram was so I didn't forget them and then everyone was like oh these are nice put, <laughs> put them into an album I was like oh yeah I think I do that you mm-hmm. know for a while I just got so sick of the sound of a piano you know <laughs> it's like I've heard this you know and then and then of course all these uh, companies that we buy our sounds from they're like oh look we got a new piano out I'm like don't care I do not yeah. care I will not buy it <laughs> you know and I'm starting mm-hmm. to fall in love with it again. Uh, James Sizemore actually uh, is, is one whose piano music has really kind of gotten me back into enjoying the sound in your clips. I've really enjoyed. So thank you for that, because to me, it's kind of like a, a lost instrument. I haven't written a song on piano. I don't even remember when the last one was. It's been, it's been a couple of years at least. Wow. Um, 
Yeah. Um, so that helps. But but I'll tell you that one of the first pieces of music I was ever asked to do for a film, it was kind of my audition piece. They uh, they had a composer, but he couldn't get this scene done. It was for a club. And so uh, they said, yeah, we need a we need a piece of club music about, you know, three minutes long or whatever it was. And uh, he was, we, we're really looking for something kind of techno. And I said, all right, well, give me an hour. And then I went, the hell is techno? <laughs> <laughs> so I get, you know, of course, I go online. I start listening to some clips. I'm like, okay, I got an idea of what I want to do. Uh, 55 minutes later, I uploaded the piece. Uh, I, I uploaded a one minute piece as, as kind of my demo. And he loved it. I wow. really feel like I got completely lucky because who who says, yeah, I can do that. And then goes, what the hell is that that they just asked me to do? <laughs> it's a pretty dumb thing to do, to be honest, but it, it worked. That's fantastic. So next time someone says to me, hey, can you do this nightclub scene? Yeah, blah, blah, techno. I'll give you a call. Yeah, give me a holler. Cool. I, I'm, I'm apparently good at it now. <laughs> Excellent. Well, congratulations, Mark. I'm, I'm so excited for this film. I can't wait to see it. It will be very soon. And I'll, I'll let you know what I think of the, the score version. But I love that you modified it for the, uh, the that actual album score release. I think that was brilliant. Uh, but I love it. I think you did such a fantastic job with it. I I can't imagine people not getting into it. I I thank you very much. I'm I'm really happy with it. I really am. Good. Um, well, that's that's the thing because yeah. you want to be able to look back on the films that you've done or or any projects that you've done and go, I'm really proud of the work I put into it but I'm really proud of the way it came out. And of course, with film, that's not always 100% within our say. The director has a lot more control over that than we do. Yeah, that's true. I, it, it would be difficult for me to be any happier than I am with how the film came out and how the soundtrack uh, comes across also. Excellent. Yeah. Well, the links are in the show notes, folks. Go check it out. Shark Reef, or The Reef, I'm sorry. The Reef Stock. <laughs> the Shark the reef is shot. The reef is, see, you got me going already. Thank you, Mark, so much for coming on the show. Uh, let's have you back on when the next thing comes out. That would be wonderful. I'll keep you, I'll keep you posted on piano developments. I'll send you my choir shtick. And yeah, uh, everyone go and watch The Reef yeah. Sport on Shudder. It's, yes. It's actually quite good, people. And, and from what I've seen, Shudder's actually got a really good amount of some really good films and some really questionable low-budget films. <laughs> but oh, yeah, uh, no, you can, you um, can end, endless entertainment on that network. My, my previous creature feature, Boar, is Boar, also yeah. on Shudder. Yeah. Oh, good. Good. But, you know, I've done, the land, I've done the land creature villain and the sea creature villain. I wonder what's next. Got to be space, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, that's true. The, the the final frontier or the next frontier, I guess it would be for you. I mean, they have Sharknado, so maybe the next thing is alien sharks. Well, they and put uh, Jason Voorhees in space. And no. they, they made a whole movie out of that. It was Jason X, uh, the 10th Friday, the 13th film. He was on a spaceship. Oh, my God. And they unfroze him for some reason. You know, because how else are you going to get him to get it was. It's worth watching one time just to see how they did it and then go, okay, this is getting to be too much now. Insane. Yeah. That's insane. Maybe, I'm hoping, you know, there, there was there was Alien versus Predator. Maybe there'll, there'll be Shark versus Boar. <laughs> there you go. Well, you know, they started, there was one company that started doing like Shark versus Octopus and they were using oh my know, God. Like giant sharks. And then it was like, they started merging animals like Croctopus, which was half <laughs> crocodile, half octopus, because that's how nature works. And it's just ridiculous. Yeah, it's. Uh, that would be good, <laughs> I mean, I, I I applaud their creativity, but I also think that somebody should have stopped that at some point. Yeah, um, I I honestly don't know what to say about that. I do know that in one of them, I I I don't know if it was Shark versus Octopus or what, but uh, '80s pop sensations Debbie Gibson and Tiffany got into a food fight in the movie. So, what? I mean, if that doesn't sell it, I don't know what would. What was Tiffany's song? Was it? Um, she did a cover of uh, I Think I'm Alone Now from Tommy James. I think, I think I'm Alone Now, right? Yeah, that I think was her biggest one. I think she did another cover that was pretty popular, too. Uh, yeah, now they're My both doing like cru cruise ships and stuff like that. My God. <laughs> it's, people will try anything. They will. They will, but I'm excited for people to check out this movie. Go to the show notes, check it out, folks. You're going to love it. Get the soundtrack. 
and uh, enjoy it because it's fantastic. Thank you so much, Mark. Definitely come back on. Thank you, Haskin McFaskin, fantastic <laughs> podcast, Raskin Rascal. That's me. Creeping up on three, 300 episodes. Uh, this is uh, coming to the last quarter of our fifth season of the show. It's been, it's been quite a ride. I should have had you on a long time ago. That's okay. We'll do it again. And meanwhile, I'll follow your Ride the Lightning adventures because I love albums. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. well, let me know what you think. I will. All right. Take care, Mark. Okay. Cheers, Bye. everybody. See ya. <laughs>